Today I'm going to talk about TensorFlow for mobile developers. I guess a few of you are familiar with this. Just very shortly, my ego slide, I'm a freelance developer. I'm part of the Google Developer Expert crew. This is my Twitter account, so you can follow me. Sometimes I put things, I will upload the, the slides of the conference as well. I'm originally from Spain. I'm the only Spaniard that doesn't like soccer, and I live in, in Germany now. Well, first, how many people um, has been working here with or knows um, TensorFlow? Machine learning? Okay. How many people use this on production? One, okay. That's one person more than what I normally see in conferences. <laughs> well, that came because of this tweet. I don't know if you follow this or you know this um, Twitter account. They, they claim this thing which happens a lot in machine learning, right? I think many developers try to uh, experiment a little bit and learn, but when it comes to practical applications, seems to be a gap between the theoretical realm and the practical realm. I saw also this tweet uh, somewhere on the, on the internet. <clears throat> what before we used to call algorithms, now it's called artificial intelligence. So if everything is artificial intelligence, then nothing is artificial intelligence. It happens the same in companies where everybody's a manager. I remember in a company I was working at, the person that just finished the university and started to work was a junior manager. So if everybody's a manager, then who's the manager? Uh, <coughs> The point I'm trying to reach is that there is a lot of uh, uh, buzzwords and uh, nobody really knows what's artificial intelligence and machine learning. I read this um, excerpt in a book called Super Intelligence. If you like reading, I, I absolutely recommend this book. Elon Musk recommends, uh, recommended it a few times in Twitter. His, um, the book is about, well, at, w at some point will happen a singularity where the machines will not need any human input anymore. And well, it starts giving a few behavioral and philosophical ideas on how can we de deal with this. And I read this excerpt here that kept my, um, got my attention. As soon as it works, no one calls it AI anymore. So sometimes there is something that works and seems to be smart, and we call it AI. But when we know how it works, then we know, OK, maybe it's not AI anymore. It's an inference, uh, inference system or a statistical system. Um, so from all the buzzwords, I think we can classify them like this. Artificial intelligence is the science of making machines smart, as in, for example, uh, cars that can self-drive, or um, a system that can uh, understand uh, human speech or generate human speech. Machine learning is the art of building machines that can learn. That means we don't need to provide them all the input that they need to know in order to take a decision. They can improve their, their knowledge by themselves. And the neural networks is one of the many different algorithms that we can use in machine learning. Is anybody here familiar with neural networks? OK, that's very cool. How many of you have programmed what neural network, maybe at the university? OK, that's very cool as well. Um, yeah, that uh, doesn't seem to be very clear here, but um, well, that was also, I found this in Twitter, and well, it's, it's another classification that we can find. So, artificial intelligence will be a field different from the machine learning. Uh, we will have also statistical reasoning, which is just something very, um, uh, we don't need any specialized person that can perform this. Any programmer could, could be able to do this, and it's based on uh, predicting or being able to generate an output based on previous uh, statistical data. That's not machine learning. Or rule-based decision making. When we have a system that pretty much goes through rules, if this rule, then the other one, that's, we can call it an algorithm or a rule, but that's not machine learning or artificial intelligence by any means. A neural network. Um, <clears throat> to keep it very easy, because it's obviously hard to define and give all the um, uh, explain very deeply how a neural ne network works, it pretty much consists of different la different layers and uh, different uh, um, uh, layers and levels that get an input and start trying to fit in within a pattern. So in this case, uh, very conceptually, we will give, a, for example, a picture of a cat and a picture of a dog. The neural network will start saying, OK, this looks like a cat based on the, all the previous training that I had, and uh, this dog doesn't look like a cat. So I start classifying this, and I will come up with an output. 
Uh, this works for images, but in general can be applied to any kind of data. Not only images, but voice, uh, and any kind of things that can be uh, pretty much serialized into bits and uh, represent uh, on a computer. Sounds, uh, etc. It's something that is, is, it actually is being worked more than we think. Uh, this is a set of products from Google. Uh, you're probably familiar with most of them. Um, and this is where Google is using currently machine learning. For example, in Google, uh, in the uh, search engine, there is uh, all this ranking. Now it's done with a lot of machine learning. The voice input when we try to fi find something. Uh, in Android, also the speech input. If you go, if you know Gmail, you have this uh, thing where you can have this automatic response, like yes, I have read this. Thank you for your uh, for your message. I will do it later, etc. In photos as well, there is a lot of machine learning. Uh, translate, tra uh, the Google Translate has been actually improving a lot. Before it was based on a system of phrases. Now it's using um, machine learning to make the translation. And let's gonna see a few examples. So here. Okay, this is my emulator, and I have a few pictures. I travel a lot to Japan, and I store my pictures here, not only the ones I take with the phone, but the ones I take with the camera, I just uh, put it into the phone or download them from 500px. And if you can tr try to do this if you have photos. Here I will look for Japan, and it will um, automatically display me all the pictures I have taken that have a relationship with Japan. This is not only geotagging, but um, Google is able to go and say, okay, this looks like a Tori door, uh, you know, these traditional doors in Japan, or Sushi, so this might have some relationship with Japan. If you have your phone, I uh, recommend you to try to look, I don't know, like Poland or uh, Tree or all these kind of uh, searches, and you will be surprised with how effective this system is. Um, then another example, I was, um, um, well, you know, if you guys, how many people here uses Inbox? Okay, so I, Use it more than Gmail, some people hate it because maybe it's not very lineal and not very sequential and take some decisions that you might not agree with, I think is great. And if I, I think right now in, in uh, Gmail this is partially implemented. So when you open an email, um, the, uh, you have an automatic response based on the context of the email and also based on the language that you can just uh, click directly and send it to the um, recipient. So in this case, it will go a little bit fast, I guess, but here one guy asked me for a conference, like, I would like to attend, and I can say I would like, I'll be there, no thank you. Here another guy, I think, asked me to remind, remind me to do something, and if I go down, he says, yes, I do, yes, I have, no, sorry. This, according to Google, is now 12% of all the responses that happen on mobile, which is, uh, it's, and it's actually increasing and getting better. This is the translation from, uh, well, if you guys know Google Translate, um, it has been improving a lot. Before the system was a system based on trees. That means we have a language A, a language B, and we want to translate. So we see more or less uh, correlating words. It was using some weird techniques, like if we want to translate from English to German, because English has a, a shorter distance, or a more, it's more effective translating to French, then we will translate first from English to French, from French to German, and you can imagine the result. It was a disaster. I remember when I was younger, um, in, do you guys know Reddit? There was some thread where people was translating from English to Japanese, and then from Japanese back to English. And it was like totally different. Things like, uh, I would like to go to my house, you translate to Japanese, then back to English, and the second sentence was like, I want to kill my cat, or these kind of things. Like, and that was used because we were using this linear um, system. Now it's using, um, um, Google Translate is using also a neural network system to make the translation. And here you can see the difference. We're trying to translate this sentence in Chinese. Using the previous one uh, will be, where will the restroom, which, okay, we might understand, or we might think this person has any problem where he's speaking. Anyway, and the second translation is, excuse me, where is the toilet, which is the proper English translation. It's working in two directions. I would like to show you a short video here that uh, Google made recently to show. It's probably funnier with music. So they are using here as well some um, uh, machine learning to identify the 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 sentences that they're showing. I don't know if you guys know this song. It's a Spanish song. It's fantastic that even if, if you see they're keeping the typography, they're keeping the colors, 
And the system sometimes is able to decide, OK, we make the translation and we will put this in the first line, in the second line, or in another line. All this has been done uh, using machine learning and neural networks. <coughs> well, it's basically three minutes like that. If you want to listen to the song, maybe later at the party. But this proves that how it's something that is here, um, as you can see, to stay. Some more examples, if you guys uh, have um, one of those devices, um, uh, there are also a lot of opportunities here. So if you guys, I, I use Hangout a lot. When somebody writes me in Hangout, I might be like, I don't know, riding with a bike. Which I should not probably check the uh, watch if I'm riding the bike or I'm in a meeting or whatever. I just can respond automatically and I don't need to um, take the computer or do uh, all these kind of things. Using also those, uh, these kind of watches, you can also make use of the motion or um, some particularities here. Well, now that we, you might have a little bit of context on machine learning. The traditional approach was to use machine learning on the cloud, because the cloud is, uh, well, we could have our servers there. Um, it's easier to make any kind of computation. Uh, but recently, Google announced TensorFlow for mobile. What could be the reasons? Well, there is the traditional approach was, as I said, uh, we would have our server performing machine learning computations. We could make an HTTP request through a REST API, sending the image, sending the data we want, waiting until it gets processed, uh, receiving it back. And this was a killer, because obviously, you need to send the, uh, the image, uh, getting it back, et cetera. And the, the example we saw before with Google Translate would not be possible. That needs to be done real time on the device. As soon as you need to go out from the device, that's not going to happen. And obviously, with the phones, you can also make sort of uh, uh, make use of another thing, such as the motion sensors. And here is when TensorFlow came into place. So uh, it's an open source library for machine learning. You can download it from here. And today is actually the most popular machine learning framework, um, not only for mobile, but uh, in general, that you can use. It's uh, being open source also have a lot of uh, feature, a lot of advantages, such as all these huge contributions for the community. And basically, we, what we do is we train models. We can do it in Mac or Windows so far. We can do it on a GPU server or on our own server or on the cloud. The prediction right now has support for Android, iOS, and Raspberry. Uh, this is a Comparison of how long it takes to um, this C four hundred is uh, ten is a benchmark with a few models, and it's about how long does it take to train those those models. And here we have the comparison for MacBook Pro uh, take twenty one hours. I think the particularly interesting thing is that we need uh, sixteen CPUs from normal computers to achieve the same efficiency as one GPU. So um, GPUs are really way more efficient and faster than uh, using CPUs. So we could probably get at our work, a lot of computers making the processing in parallel. But as soon as we introduce GPUs, uh, things can really speed up. And you might need that depending on the nature of the problem you want to solve. Um, yeah, <clears throat> Some of the companies that are uh, using it on, uh, on a real production application. So that's the point. It's not anymore something that it's only for uh, bored people at their place. And well, this guy from here, Jufeng, he's, I think he's a developer advocate at Google. He um, um, had this concept on from training to app. He started training some models, uh, uh, made a mobile application, and started making all the detection. And he claimed that made it in three hours, which I think it could be, it could be well possible. And I would like to go through the entire process so you see how you can move from the idea of uh, detecting a model into actually having an application for that. OK, first we need to train a model a lot of examples um, about this model. Traditionally, images, if we want to train a model that detects images. Any approach, how would you solve this if you need, like, now a lot of training data? Could be easier. We could, for example, take a video. Because at the end, a video is a lot of images together. So if I want to detect this glass, I could just take a lot of uh, uh, frames of it. So yeah, I have this example here. This is a, a stupid example. Just a bottle. If you want to make this uh, um, 
depending on the problem you want to solve, you might want to use different backgrounds, using bottles that are open, that are not different levels of brightness, but you get the point. This is a very good uh, starting, uh, starting thing. There is an example from Google that can detect different breeds of cats. And obviously, for this example, you know, probably requires a lot more training because cats might not only have a breed, but a shape and a bigger face or all these kind of things. But this is a good start to prove a concept. OK, we have our data initially. We can use any um, open source tool. Um, this FFMPG can take a video, get all the frames, and store it in any folder. That would be an example. We could have here our uh, 1,000, 10,000 set of images. And when we have this, we could actually, um, uh, in order to train the model, this was the approach of uh, using it on the cloud. Um, there is a Google storage where we can upload our images via um, FTP, or there is also an HTTP uh, uh, API to upload them. And they also provide training. As I said, that's the old way. We could make the training on the cloud, get in our model, our file model, and then start operating with this. Now, imagine we have reached this point. Um, let's gonna see. Let's gonna try to explain a little bit conceptual how a convolutional neural network works. I like this example. It's also from Jufen. You know these kind of illustrations. I think the beam is not very clear, uh, but this is an Escher picture. Is the guy that makes uh, roads that connect with other roads and have impossible geometrical um, uh, shapes. So if we, I don't know if the, <laughs> well, I can try to explain what's here. That's, uh, imagine a puzzle, okay? We have a puzzle from Esther with many different shapes. How would you solve that puzzle? As a human, not as a machine. The initial approach could be, okay, I'm gonna try to take all of them that have the same color and try to put them together. In the case of Esther, here there are like, is three colors or a few tonalities, so you could say the ones that are white and the ones that are darker, I can put them together and I can start operating from there. Here actually in this picture that is not very clear, on the left side there are the totally white ones, and on the right one there are the, uh, the ones that have a little bit more of color. Thinking as a human, which is not very different of how a neural network will work. Okay, now that we are there, we can start thinking about more patterns. If you know any way better way of solving a puzzle, tell me, but I think this, this is how one to do it. Now when we have this classification, we could go and check the, the picture and say, okay, there is some, uh, as we can see there, some uh, roof and the roof has some pieces and there are different type of roofs, so we could try to find the individual ones. Okay, that's much better here. Yeah. Okay, maybe I can show you from here. You see the colors it has, the classification we make. And now here we could start finding patterns. So now that we have the patterns, we can uh, start finding the pictures, right? We would say, okay, we can find this, uh, this roof. Uh, there are like two roof types. We will start getting different pieces, and when we have them, we will fit them together. Now we can see this thing here. The, we have like a hand holder. We have the stairs. We know this is straight lines, and we know there might be some shape connected to the other one. It's the same procedure. We start finding individually those pictures, try to put them together until we can start making somehow a pattern. And at some point we arrive in something like this. This is uh, a very good allegory of how a neural network it works. It starts finding pattern, different patterns, and see this is the, the information I have from my, from my model. So I will try to fit everything within this. Now, the, what we are using in TensorFlow for uh, creating models is a network of, uh, well, this is a network of, of 48 levels. All those levels are the levels we create to detect patterns in Inception 4. That's the last version from Google. If you think 48 is too much or too little, because if you just throw 48, that doesn't give any context. As an example, if in 2011, it was pretty much impossible to use more than four levels. And every level here is exponential. So it has been a huge boom since the, uh, in the last few years. So um, yeah, when we're training our model, we also have to optimize it for mobile. As we know, mobiles have a very limited capability. 
we cannot have very big files there. Um, we also cannot download uh, many megabytes. Um, it's not like a desktop application. So in order to optimize models for mobile, um, TensorFlow has a tool to make, well, or better, when we train a model out of training it, it takes around 80 megabytes. That's uh, using the Inception version 4. Um, this actually doesn't work directly on mobile because um, there are some operations that are not recognized in the, in the mobile uh, TensorFlow, so we need to quantize it. Basically, a model is a big file with a lot of float numbers. Those float numbers have 32 bits. And by quantizing it, what we do is we re reduce them from 38 to 8 bits, which is reducing the size four times, and moving the model from 80 into um, 20 megabytes. You could say, but this might make the model less accurate. That's a fair question. It actually doesn't um, decrease the accuracy in a factor of four. The neural networks are designed to be very tolerant with fuzzy input. So basically, the, the part we're getting rid of are these edge cases. Reducing the model from 32 to 8 bits, it doesn't reduce the accuracy by four. Um, according to Google, it's by 1.2 in most of the cases, which is pretty much the, the same as the original one. A uh, few things more, yeah. If, uh, for example, in this is a still a lot of um, very big for our application, we could use another inception network. The version one uses uh, seven megabytes when it's quantized, so that could be another option based on the problem you're solving. Something to consider, TensorFlow increases the APK by 12 megabytes. It's also something you have to keep in mind. And well, let's say now we have our model, it's optimized for mobile, and now we need to load it into our Android application. Here there are two approaches. We can, well, uh, Android or iPhone. We can deliver the model with the Android app inside the same APK, which means downloading APK with TensorFlow plus the models, or we can have uh, a sort of system where the APK doesn't come with the models. Then we obviously need to program in the application. Let's say we can store them in, do you guys know Firebase? How many people knows it? Good. So Firebase has this Firebase storage. You could, for example, say I will keep the model here. I will integrate Firebase in my app and download the model so the application is not very big. I can get them on request. I think the argument to zip everything together is the security. I heard that from many people wrongly. Because they say, well, it's on the same APK, so you cannot access the model, which might be something very domain specific. And that's unfortunately not right, because if your phone is root or you have an emulator, you just can install, get APK, and access to everything. The TensorFlow community has 1,000 uh, plus contributors, 22,000 uh, commits, and 18,000 repositories with the name TensorFlow. So it's not any more than an experiment. It's something with some real use cases. I think actually looking for TensorFlow in uh, repositories, you can filter them by popularity and contribution, and it's a, a good idea to find things that people are doing. That's, uh, this is in Google Trend, so the popularity of TensorFlow has been uh, growing together with machine learning, and now it's a, it's a very important part of the, the machine learning field. And I would like to go very shortly and show you a few examples on, uh, well, how can we build this with, uh, with Android Studio? Google is providing us with samples for Android Studio and iOS and Raspberry, I think. I haven't built the ones of Raspberry. Um, Android uses Basel to build. Um, well, you need to set the Basel binary location in this, uh, in this address from here. You need to add the project uh, that you don't love from the TensorFlow examples to Android Studio. I personally had a lot of trouble here because you need to have a particular version of Basel. I think it's 0.6. And it works with Android Studio, but not the beta preview. So uh, that's something you probably need, want to check on the instructions. You have all the de uh, detailed instructions here. And you can download the Basel from, uh, from the this URL. More. You need to the Android SDK, at least the version 23. You need to download the Android NDK, only the version 12V, because it's breaking with the other ones. Now I can put it here, but I remember it took me like one entire day to see like, okay, fuck, this is not working. I'm going to kill myself. Yeah, and uh, well, it's recommended to do with the Android SDK manager, because uh, if you do it by yourself, I did it by myself, and it was not working. So I don't know what Android SDK is doing under the hood. 
more. There is a workspace file that you need to replace with uh, the path where you have the SD key. This is my case, where I keep them. And this is the path where I keep the my NDK bundle. And uh, then we need to run Basel to build all the demos. And we should have then access to to the APK that we can install and then uh, see some of the um, the demos from Google. Um, I was uh, well. One of the things in this demo with Google is that it's very cool. They provide some sample models. I will show them later, but you can just put your samples or your models immediately. You don't need to do anything special. If we can hear to Android Studio, this is how the, the demo looks. We see that how they include the models is just by using this uh, field here. So if you have trained your model, you can literally came to this application, add your model or substitute your model, and you will have an application that is able to detect uh, the models on the uh, on real time. <coughs> Now play again, and um, so you, it's a little bit of a pain in the ass. Or you can use TensorFlow from the G Center. One step, and get rid of all those problems. But the, uh, there are a few problems here. The uh, transformation between the YUV and RGB formats is uh, less efficient than uh, if we compile it by ourselves, and the object tracking is not available, which is a killer. This might change at some point, but this is the situation as it is right now. Uh, there are three uh, samples provided by Android. One of them is uh, classify, to be able to classify different items based on models we have. Another one called detect, where we can detect um, models on the screen. And another one to STLI is based, based on uh, artistic algorithms. Uh, the classify version use Google Inception version, version 3 to level some images. The model is very easy to swap. As I saw, you just need to train your model and put it there. There is no person level, which is very cool. So there are many models, but none of them is person. Because then we can point everywhere, and we would see like a BIMA, or um, projector, uh, router, phone, etc. And if we click off the volume, we will uh, we'll get the statistics based on the performance. This would be an example. This is just an image. We point here, and this says, this is a Granny Smith apple, which is cool. It doesn't say that it's only an apple. It says the kind of apple it is. With this uh, percentage of accuracy, and I recorded this uh, video with my poor girlfriend. Uh, here I'm pointing to my wallet, and it actually says that it's a wallet. Here I'm pointing to my uh, phone, and it says it's an iPod, iPod, which is not fully right. Here it's saying that this is a keyboard and a laptop. Yeah, computer keyboard, notebook. And pointing here, it tells me that it's a water bottle. So it doesn't even say bottle, it says water bottle. Um, you can download these, uh, these files, actually. You don't need to download the samples. You don't need to compile them. You just can uh, uh, download them from GitHub. And they're really amazing. If uh, you point, you get a lot of surprises. Even pointing at pets, sometimes they can detect, like, this is a, this kind of cat or this kind of dog. It's a German shepherd. Um, this is the one to the example to detect people. Uh, in this case, uh, what we draw is boxes around the, the people that the application is detected. It's useful to count objects. So if we have a model, we just point to the screen and we can say there are as many cars or as many whatever we are counting. There is unfortunately no training for this demo. Might change at any point in the future. And the last sample for Android is the styling example. Um, it provides, it takes some, uh, well, uh, it's, it's called a style transfer algorithm, and applies, they apply them over an image. Uh, this is uh, a style transfer algorithm is very cool because it's uh, are algorithms that define an artistical style. So you can have one that makes things similar to a Picasso drawing or similar to a shared drawing or whatever is in your imagination. And I don't know if you guys know Magenta. Does anybody know it? It's a framework to generate those models. So uh, we could use Magenta and to train like uh, things, uh, models that perform an artistical, um, uh, has an, creates an artistical style that we can apply of pictures. Magenta also has something very cool, which is uh, it can be used to generate music based on different styles. So you can train this model and say, I want to make some jazz music or some rock music. And it actually looks very. Uh, very human. It's, uh, I think there was an experiment uh, where uh, some people were showing music uh, from Magenta and some real music, and they were not able to 
find who was the real uh, artist and who was the computer, which is pretty much the Turing test. And then when they were told you made the wrong choice, then they say, ah, now it's, they were, I don't know, maybe it's our resistant to. Okay, this is another example. Here I'm pointing to a, to a cap. And uh, well, there are different models. You just can combine them even, save them. Uh, and here you can also download new ones, and it, it changes totally. This one might be a little bit more abstract, but you can use one that makes it hyper realistic, etc. A little bit more TensorFlow for Android. Uh, TensorFlow is written in C, and Android uses Kotlin or Java. Very easy to use it. Um, similar to how we use the ND key, there is something called Android Inference Library that uses to bridge between um, uh, Java and our TensorFlow code. This is actually not very not very hard to use, uh, very, very easy to set up, and you can directly access the TensorFlow library. Building for iOS is way easier. How many people here develops for iOS? OK, for Android? More Android than good. More business there. Yeah, so for iOS, it's, it's way easier. You need Xcode, you will have it already, the command line tools, you will probably have Automake and all this stuff. Uh, you only need to build uh, everything, all the uh, samples for iOS, it takes 20 minutes. And iOS provides three, um, three samples. One of them is uh, to uh, load a model and give some, uh, well, provides here some output information, not very exciting. The next one is a camera. This is fucking amazing. Is the one that can tell you which uh, type of cat uh, is that one. Uh, here you can see that could be a tiger cat, Egyptian cat. It gives you the percentage of that. I think they provide the same for um, dogs as well. So if you have a dog and you don't have anything to do next week, you can see which kind of dog you have. And uh, yeah, it, it runs in Inception, one Inception uh, neural network on its frames, and the models also can be replaced. So you can train your own model and, and upload it. And they have one for benchmark. This one is interesting because it takes, uh, well, it puts you a lot of information on how long it takes to load the model, to uh, make the detection per frame, etc. So it could be useful if at some point you need to show, like, okay, for this model, things are going faster than another one, etc. Now, for Raspberry Pi, I don't know if Gautier is here or not. It's um, another colleague. He was showing the same example. So in this example, uh, there was a Japanese guy that uh, he had a family business where um, they were um, raising cucumbers. And they have many different types of cucumbers. They could be long. Uh, they could be shorter. They could be fresher. They could be more greener. Normally, they had four people working there. and. They had like all the cucumbers coming. They were like a little bit similar, like when uh, uh, chicken sexers, the people that say this is a male or a female. So they were like, okay, this is a cucumber A, B, and throwing them to different places. And the guy said like, okay, we could probably automatize this using TensorFlow, Raspberry Pi, and Internet of Things. So he trained several models that were able to uh, guess which kind of cucumber were the cucumbers that uh, they were going on the on the track and some kind of mechanism that were pushing them into one direction or another. And um, he claimed that, uh, well, the result was pretty much very, uh, very accurate. Here we have the cucumber going through the, uh, and depending on which type of cucumber it was, it was moving to a different box or another. Um, yeah, this is one guy that made this at his place with a Raspberry B beam, so, Obviously, like low budget and more like a, a proof of concept, but it's amazing the fact that, well, imagine what you know with real resources and uh, yeah, well, that's just you know to see that if it could work. But he he had a, he wrote I think in he wrote it in Japanese, then Google translated it, and he was claiming that it was super efficient because uh, the cucumbers were really like okay, the big ones are big ones, so if you have a model that only trains big ones, it's gonna discard the small ones. And um, well, that's uh, pretty much uh, everything. Um, a few interesting th links here. Well, TensorFlow, you just can Google it and uh, uh, download access to GitHub. They have a few samples. Uh, Magenta is, as I mentioned, this framework for artistic uh, development. Even if you are not interested in having a in finding an uh, application for production, I think it's really cool to see exactly what they are doing 
creating music and art is, uh, is really amazing. And um, Google has a code lab. It's uh, basically a training session. Uh, it's called TensorFlow for Poets, and so is how to make the, the training on your own computer which uh, is something you might be interested in. They go through a lot of concepts here. They go a little bit deeper into what is a neural network, etc. I think it's also worth it to, to do it. It takes absolutely less than a day. You're probably done in two, three hours. Um, uh, then last but not least, um, I think feedback is great. If you guys uh, want to give me any feedback for about the talk, yes, you can go to this address here, bit.ly mobilization2017. I will send you a copy of a book I wrote uh, with questions and answers to, uh, for Android interviews. You can use them as a person applying for or as a person that is making interviews. And any kind of feedback, as long as it's constructive, is highly appreciated. And that was pretty much everything. So. I have a question regarding this UI, uh, UYUV uh, to RGB conversion. Since I think that should be feasible to just convert this uh, this model to accept a different format of uh, image. So uh, do I miss something? I think that's, that's my perception. I'm, <clears throat> I don't know the Google agenda. Uh, what I think is that so far, they have stripped many things from, from TensorFlow, and one of them is the conversion. Might be because it takes a lot of space, or uh, they, they're, I think for them right now, the concern is that it's already 12 megabytes. They don't want to increase it more. Okay. So maybe this model right now was um, bigger than they were expecting. I remember I was using OpenCV, okay. like back in time when OpenCV was used. And uh, this kind of image conversion was uh, one of the heavy libraries that they were using. Yeah. Might be that the reason. I'm not really sure. Uh, great presentation, by the way. Uh, do you know any commercial applications using TensorFlow on mobile? Well, Google claim, uh, um, and I, I think uh, it's also on their website, Airbnb and Uber are using uh, uh, TensorFlow. Where, whether they are using it, uh, probably not for GMX recognition. I, at least I don't know in the application of Airbnb that you make any, any kind of image recognition. But it can also be used for different things, such as language translation, or even finding patterns, or making translation in real time. In the slide I put over here, I know, well, I, you probably don't consider this commercial, right? Yeah. <laughs> OK, thank you very much. Yeah. There are these, uh, yeah, these few companies here that uh, are using it. Let me go back. So uh, yeah, in which model they're exactly using it, I, I'm not really sure. But uh, yeah, probably with some kind of uh, learning, uh, you know, trying to stri strike patterns from the whatever users, conversations, etc. Uh, can you go to the last slide? Just kidding. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, TensorFlow and Apple's CoreML seems to be like the competitive solutions. Is there any, without going into much details, is there any like outstanding difference between them? Between TensorFlow and? Core ML from Apple. Uh, I'm not really familiar with the, the Apple solution. I'm OK. That makes sense. Yeah. Thanks. Mm. <laughs> OK. So thank you very much.